this video we're going to review the Yule Thompson effect. Uh, this video follows from a prior one in which we have seen how the enthalpy depends on temperature and pressure. Following the, that work in the prior video, uh, we recover this expression that tells us exactly how the enthalpy changes with pressure and temperature. Now in that work we have seen that there's a coefficient that we have introduced which is called the Yule Thompson coefficient and uh, the explanation of that coefficient is as follows. Uh, this is simply the first derivative of the temperature with respect to pressure at constant enthalpy. Okay, so the purpose of this video is to try to learn a little bit more about uh, this coefficient and how you would determine it. Okay, so uh, what we actually have to do is, uh, uh, we're gonna do this for a guess because those things tend to be simpler. And uh, essentially what we're trying to do here is see how the temperature of a gas changes when you're changing its pressure in a process that needs to be isenthalpic or constant enthalpy. Okay, that is the condition. So that's our, our departing point. How do you come up with an isenthalpic, uh, isenthalpic process, a process in which the uh, enthalpy doesn't change? All right, to illustrate that, uh, we have here a diagram uh, uh, with an isenthalpic, isenthalpic process. Right, so the way to understand this is you have a gas uh, or a container that has two compartments, the left one and the right one. And those compartments are separated by a porous membrane uh, that allows for the passage of gas, but quite slowly. The pores are, are quite small, and that means that the gas molecules need to, uh, as they, they flow through those pores, they're getting in contact with each other and interacting with each other. Okay, but in essence, uh, initially, there's nothing in the right compartment, the volume is zero, and all the gas is in the left compartment. Uh, and then you're going to compress that gas, uh, constant pressure, P1, and eventually that gas flows through the membrane and it ends up in the right compartment, uh, which will have a different set of conditions, P2, V2, T2. Okay, so uh, we're going to demonstrate now that uh, when you do this adiabatically, right, so you're not allowing for any energy transfer as heat uh, into the system or out of the system, then the process will be isenthalpic. To demonstrate that, we first can write here what uh, the change in, inter in internal energy would be for that process. Again, uh, the first law tells you that this is uh, heat and work, but of course if we're doing this adiabatically, what that means is that uh, that uh, energy transfer as heat is zero. Okay, so you only have a work component. Now, there's going to be two types of work, right? Notice that uh, on the left-hand side, you have a compression. So, so that would be compression work. And on the right-hand side, you have an expansion. All right, so, uh, well, the pressures are constant. Uh, we can control that. And that means that this expression for uh, that type of work is actually going to be quite simple. All right, uh, so that would be constant pressure, so that would be minus P1, and then the change in volume. Uh, right, notice that uh, the final volume in the left compartment is zero, right? So when the uh, compression finishes, this piston is flush against the, uh, the membrane, so there's no volume left, so that would be final volume is zero, and then the initial volume is uh, V1. And uh, in the right-hand side of the compartment, this will be now an expansion, so that will be minus uh, P2, that is the final pressure, which is constant, and then the final volume, V2, uh, minus zero, which is the initial volume. When the uh, expansion starts in the right compartment, the piston is flush against that membrane, so there's no initial volume, uh, and that's how uh, the expressions for work are. All right, so let's put all these together to find out that this is going to be equal to P1 V1 minus P2 V2. All right, again, our goal is to demonstrate that this uh, adiabatic expansion will be isenthalpic. Okay, so, so that's what we're gonna do next. Try to calculate what the change in enthalpy is uh, for a process like that. Well, we know that the definition of enthalpy is change in internal energy plus the change in the uh, pressure volume product Okay, and uh, well, we actually know what this is. We just calculated it right here. Okay, notice that we have here the change in internal energy. This is the heat and the work. It's adiabatic, so no heat. And then uh, we have that, right? So that will be delta H is going to be equal to P1 V1 minus P2 V2. Okay, great. So uh, now let's actually think about what this term is.
this is just um, the change in the product of pressure and volume. So it will be the product of the pressure and volume in the final state minus the product of the uh, uh, pressure and volume in the initial state. So that is going to be P2 V2 minus P1 V1. Okay, and you can clearly see that this is indeed an isentropic process. The change in enthalpy is zero. Right, so then uh, in order to determine this uh, Joule Thompson co coefficient, what you actually have to do is simply measure what is the change in temperature in this gas, so T1, T2, uh, for a given change in pressure uh, when those pressures are pretty low. Okay, so that's what you will have to do. Uh, uh, so again, uh, make sure that uh, that change in pressure, so the difference between P1 and P2 tends to zero, it's a small change as you do that. And then if you're able to measure the difference in temperature, that would be your, your joule thompson coefficient. Okay, so uh, that's a way to do it. This is not difficult to do. You can actually uh, put here a thermometer, right, to measure the difference in temperature, and then you can control the pressures, uh, uh, and then be able to measure this joule thompson uh, coefficient. Okay, so um, uh, what is the importance of this joule thompson coefficient? Well, uh, it turns out that uh, that joule thompson coefficient reports on the type of interactions that are dominant in that gas at those particular conditions. Okay, and we're going to see uh, various cases. In an ideal gas, there's no interactions between gas particles, so that joule thompson coefficient is co uh, completely zero. What that would mean is that if you have an ideal gas, uh, it turns out that the enthalpy does not depend on pressure, right? The whole this is zero because the joule thompson coefficient is zero, and then the, the only thing that you have to worry about is the dependence of the enthalpy on temperature, but that's just the heat capacity at constant pressure. Okay, again, this is for an ideal gas. Now, for real gases, this changes, okay, and what you can have that this uh, coefficient can be either positive or negative. Okay, so let's see uh, those cases a little bit more. All right, uh, when this is positive, which is uh, most of the time for many, many gases, except for perhaps hydrogen and maybe helium, an ambient condition, so so about room temperature and pressures close to ambient pressure, uh, with most gases will have a positive yield also coefficient, and that means that attractions are dominant. Okay, so how do we explain this? How do we, well, why do you have a positive yield also coefficient when attractions are dominant? That's easy to explain when you think about this, right? So uh, we're going to ex uh, assume a case here in which the final pressure is a little bit less than the initial pressure. Okay, what that means is that this denominator uh, is actually negative. Okay? In order for the yule thompson coefficient to be positive, then the change in temperature has to be negative as well. And that means that the gas cools uh, in this expansion if the final pressure is less than the initial pressure. Okay, so uh, uh, right, how, how can that gas cool and, and what is the, you know, how is that connected to attractions? Yeah, all right, so the idea here is that when you're pushing that gas, through the pores of that membrane, those gas molecules are actually, or particles, are getting really close to each other so they, they can really interact. Now if attractions are dominant as those molecules are flowing through the membrane, then uh, uh, when the gas starts to expand on the right hand side of the container, what happens is that, well, those molecules start to get, uh, separate from each other, but the attractions are holding them back, right? So they won't expand as much as, as they would otherwise. Or another way to see this is that, well, uh, uh, you know, the, those, those particles would separate with some kinetic energy, but if there's an attraction that is holding back on those molecules, then the kinetic energy is lower than it would be, and that means that that gas is being cooled down, okay? So, so that makes perfect sense out here. As a matter of fact, Yule Thompson, uh, this Yule Thompson effect uh, can be explained every time, or can you, you can see it every time that you pump a tire, an, a, a flat tire, with a CO2 cartridge, right? When you have a CO2 cartridge, that's CO2 at really high pressure, and you're actually passing it through the valve of the tire into a situation of low pressure, right? And, and it's very easy to see that the gas cools down. Sometimes you can actually even see uh, uh, water from the ambient uh, environment condensing around the valve from the rim of that tire, uh, again, depending on, on uh, relative humidity and things like that, but that gas cool, cooling uh, when you're pumping tires with CO2 cartridges, it's actually really easy to see. You can see in real life. This is a very common occurrence. Now, uh, conversely, if this Joule-Thompson coefficient is negative, uh, 
then that would mean that repulsions are dominant. Right, and the idea here is that if repulsions are dominant, well, when the gas is getting, uh, those gas particles are getting really close to each other, uh, if the repulsions are dominant, that means that as they make it through the right-hand side of that uh, system, right, they're going to separate with a larger kinetic energy than uh, if those interactions were not present. And, and what that means is that, well, that, that increased kinetic energy uh, from the repulsions, that's, that's a cooling uh, of that gas, right? That gas is traveling at higher speeds than it would otherwise would. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, that's how these limits for the science of the yule thompson coefficient. Okay, so in this video we have uh, studied what the yule thompson uh, effect is by showing how you can do an ice enthalpy process and then examining the limits uh, in the science of that yule thompson coefficient.